Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before I start, uh, just a quick message to everyone who subscribes to Risk Dials. The website is truly screwed up uh, and it's going to take a long time. So please send me uh, requests and uh, your email and I will make sure that you have the links to the video uh, and I will keep a record of them so you won't need to do it again. But for this week uh, as well, could you please send me your requests for links and I will make sure that you receive the video. Okay, so what do we have next week? We have Humphrey Hawkins testimony by Powell and we have NFP. We've had a very strange week of trading in terms of price action, I think, uh, in, uh, in bonds and the yield curve. I can't say I understand it, but let's have a look at what the possibilities are for next week and what would make sense. The one thing that makes sense and which has continued last week is that the very short end, the twos and fives, are just not supported. And, you know, I've been saying for a long time that the Fed will have to go mo most probably higher for longer. Now, the question for next week is becomes how fast do we get to the terminal rate and what the terminal rate is, and then lastly, how long we will stay at that terminal rate. So, Powell is on the hill delivering his semi-annual Humphrey Hawkins testimony. He has the possibility to state where he is and preempt his colleagues. It is obvious that there are some, there may be non-voters at the moment, but there is fluidity in the ranks about what the appropriate response to this acceleration of inflation in January um, is. Is it to go back to 50s in terms of hikes or is it to remain at 25s and maybe do another one or two 25s than, than are implied in the dot plots? Or is it, as I said, to go back to 50s to really smack inflation down? Well, if Powell wants to, he has the possibility to basically pre-announce what his thoughts are via a planted question or just a reply to a question that he can just, you know, slide it in there, as it were. I don't know what, naturally whether he's going to do that or not, but that is what I am looking for on Wednesday. Uh, something from him that says where he is and therefore stifles any argument at the FOMC because nobody can go against him. Uh, he will have pre-announced his position and everybody else has to basically fall in line because otherwise they would be seen as unsupportive or whatever. So that's basic man management. That's what I would do if I wanted to stamp my authority on that uh, FOMC. You know, is he going to do it? I have no idea. But let's have a look at what is likely to happen if he does do that and what he in and, and if he doesn't do that. I think for the Fed to be truly data dependent, I agree with El Arian what he's been saying, is that they should go to fifty. It would, you know, it, it would really not move prices that much from here. And what it would do is actually give people much more confidence that the Fed is on top of the situation. To me, the long end should not like a Fed that is more passive. They should prefer a Fed that is uh, proactive. The short end, of course, the opposite. I think if, uh, uh, if Powell is very non-committal, we could easily go to this kind of level 
around 465, something like that, easily in the twos. And if he is hawkish, I don't think we go uh, beyond 499. I would have thought that if, if he's very hawkish and pre-announces a 50, anything you manage to buy before 499 to 5, you get rid of. Because I don't think it's going to, um, the market is actually probably going to like it in a way. So those are my expectations for the very short end. If Powell is hawkish, you don't trade anything above 5% uh, or you certainly don't want to stay with any longs above 5% in the twos. And if he is dovish, you're looking for somewhere around this kind of area, 465 to 467, back to this kind of equilibrium. But that's about it. After that, I would have thought the market would reassert the primary trend and go back up. In terms of other tenures, I think fives, this is the level to watch, 406. I can't see it much below that. I think uh, shorts in futures at that level are, I think at that level, really shorts in futures are uh, a good bet. That's as far as I can see the fives coming back because, you know, the market has to hedge the auctions and has to hedge them far enough uh, because we have uh, NFP on Friday and that could really move the market afterwards. So I would have thought the first couple of days the market does nothing much, <clears throat> then it reacts on PAL but because we have the auctions and we need to hedge them, especially in 10s and 30s, you are then looking uh, for the market to trade in with slight stability. So if we look at the 10s, I would have thought that this kind of level, uh, 385, very unlikely to be below it uh, after, uh, unless Powell says something incredible and because we just need to hedge that auction. And we will probably be somewhere around here, 391, 392, 394 uh, at the auction before NFP. What does NFP do? I don't think it does much because not a single number that we've had in terms of unemployment has been anything you know, bearish for the uh, for the unemployment uh, situation, in which case it's unreasonable to expect an NFP that's particularly weak. We might have some revisions for January, which were very strong, uh, but I think the market is going to ignore them. I just don't see a period of lower interest rates coming out of NFP because that there just is not a single number which indicates that uh, non-farm payrolls are turning. Maybe at some stage, but I very much doubt that this is the, the time that NFP will be turning. And therefore, I think any reaction back down to these kind of levels uh, after NFP is an opportunity to uh, reassert longs, something like a 0 0.382 retracement, which would be somewhere around here. You're talking 380. I doubt the market goes below 380 for a considerable period of time. In terms of 30s, which are by far the strongest, you're looking at something like this, 376. That's as far as I think the market can go on the downside. What is puzzling to me is why the market has chosen this time for an acceleration in the flattening trend, which has been going on for a long time. Okay, so these are 5s, 30s, and I can't tell you how pivotal this 43 level is. If we go to uh, a monthly chart and go back, that is basically as negative as the market has been for a long, long time. We 
got to 60 uh, back in uh, 2000 but really we stayed there not a long time and then when you know this is a monthly chart but then we collapsed from it I have no idea why the market has chosen this time to be this, uh, you know, to, to do this kind of flattening, but it's a trend and it seems that I'm very wrong in my 10s, 30s. It looks like it's going to go to at least 19. And then, you know, the all time highs are here around the 39 to 40 level. But every time it's done this, it's eventually come back uh, a long way to an, the average of the 10s, 30s, which is 67. So if you can't take that kind of a move, um, I would get the hell out because this, this is presaging a period of either much higher short term rates and that could make sense via a very bearish uh, Humphrey Hawkins or a very bearish NFP or both, i.e. an acceleration of the trend in the short end. Uh, and we are talking then the fives going way above 5%, uh, sorry, the twos going way above 5%, something that the long bonds like. So the long bonds stay stable while the short end does another jump higher of another 25 basis points. That is what the yield curve is saying. Now, uh, whether that is going to be correct or not, I don't know. But certainly what the yield curve is saying is higher for longer uh, and more flattening. It's strange that it's saying that in this uh, this particular time, but you can't argue with it. The um, it, it's unmistakable, especially when tens thirties inverts, and that is very very rare, uh, far rarer than twos tens or anything like that. That is a signal of instability ahead and probably big moves in the short end. And I will show you now what happened uh, back in the early 80s when I wasn't trading. So I, you know, I wasn't around for that. But some really weird stuff happened then. Okay, so I have to show you uh, on this because it goes back further than, uh, than the trading view. So here we are at negative eight basis points and we go back in time back in time back in time back in time and what i want to show you is this period of the early 80s when i wasn't around so i don't know what was happening really i've only ever experienced stuff from here onwards and here we have zero and here we have negative 50 and negative up to negative 80. So the only time the yield curve really has been more negative than it is at the moment was in that period when it went. And, and don't forget that this is a period of very, very rapid tightening, uh, far more rapid than anything that we've seen now. And then the 10s, 30s went all the way to negative 80 uh, before very quickly falling back down to uh, into positive territory. So it's always, even when it happens um, in a very violent way, it's always a very temporary phenomenon because the Fed always manages to uh, refrain inflation. But, you know, um, I haven't seen this. I had to go back to this chart and look at it to see how negative 10s, 30s can get. But I would have thought that in this 30, 30 to 50 area, it's, it's huge risk reward on the, um, on the downside in the spread. So, you know, I will probably get out of my 10s, 30s. And here we are at zero. And this is where we are. We are here at seven. Uh, so to give you the, um, we are right here at the moment. 
but you can see how far it can go on but only during very rapid periods of tightening i mean we're talking about tightening of four five hundred basis points at the short end here in uh, late 80 81 uh, so i just doubt that it can persist but i'm just showing you for you know because i have this position on so i have to manage it i can't take it going into the 50s but I am looking for levels to put it back on again. And I would have thought the first level is somewhere around uh, this 30 level. And that's all I can say. I just cannot see that we are in that kind of a period. I, I, it would just mean a huge acceleration of inflation. But there you go. I just want you to be aware of what the possibilities here are. Finally, look at the uh, move index. It's just not coming down, is it? Even though we had a very good day on Friday, the um, it, it you know it it's unconvincing. Okay, it 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 does make some sense because we do have these important events next week, and then followed by uh, the uh, the CPI and the Fed, but. You know, it, it just gives me pause for thought. If it won't go any lower than this, uh, then we are unlikely to be in a period of uh, stability for very much longer, i.e. what the move index is saying to me is that all the danger is still in the on the upside in yields uh, and stronger moves in bonds at some stage later on. But for the moment, I would have thought that it makes far more sense that after NFP we come back down towards the 114 level, then we go straight above. And any move by the, uh, uh, right, any move by the move uh, down to this kind of level is actually going to be bullish for equities, I think, because um, you know, volatility in equities is just going to keep on uh, coming lower and bleeding as it is at the moment. The one market that I think has very little hope of doing better still is Germany. And I think, you know, being short of Germany is uh, the preferred position in just about everything. C can the Schatz do a little bit better? Yes, probably. But I think any dip on, say, to something which is bullish in the US or some retracement in the US is going to be an opportunity to uh, buy puts or put spreads in shats. Without a doubt, shats at some stage will uh, go higher uh, and be in the 340s. If we have actually have a look at the monthly chart, I would have thought that this 340 level is very very likely to be touched uh, you know, probably by the time the um, uh, the uh, uh, what's it called the ECB comes around and then uh, we will probably still not be in restrictive territory I think there's a high likelihood that at some stage we have to go to this kind of level which is 429 but that is, you know, for some other time. Certainly, the, this is the least uh, risky and with the best reward contract. Now, the fives, the bobble, actually reached my target on Thursday and has probably room to come back down towards 260. But when it does, it's, you know, another high risk reward short. And the tens probably has room to come back down to this 257 area, but that's probably as far as it goes. At that level, you just buy some put spreads in the futures and uh, look, you know, watch it do worse. Where do I think eventually goes? I think there's very little doubt that it will touch this 290 level. Uh, it just 
it's unlikely not to touch it. So any kind of a dip, it's an opportunity to buy, uh, to buy put spreads. And really, if you look at the crosses uh, between US and Germany on a monthly level, any rally, this is twos twos, any rally, you know, it's going to go down. To me, this is the kind of level that it eventually bottoms out at in uh, in the uh, twos twos, which is a differential of around, let's call it 100 basis points. So we probably have another 60, 70 basis points over the course of months. This is a monthly chart. Don't forget, if we have a look at a daily chart, this kind of level is going to be very hard to break for the next few weeks. But when it does, it's going to go all the way down to here around one. If we look at fives fives, my eventual target is back down here around one. And if we ever look at tens tens, my eventual target here is around 105. So still Germany is far favored in shorts uh, rather than uh, the US. And you can see that any uh, move back up in the Bund Treasury yield uh, differential to around 135, 140, I think you won't see 152 again, is an opportunity for shorts again for the final leg, which is going to be around this 105 level. Given that I see German rates rising faster than US rates, it's not surprising that the dollar really can't make much headway to the upside. I still keep on saying this 106.25 level is a very good risk reward level to do dollar shorts. But on the other hand, um, you know, I think that until Humphrey Hawkins for sure and, un and, and until NFP, it's not going to happen. Um, I just can't see the impulsion here coming from anything uh, that I'm seeing. Uh, as, I, as you saw, the bond rates are unlikely to go higher in the very short term, not until Wednesday, uh, and only then if Powell says something in, you know, pretty bearish and goes for a 50. But the ECB are going for 50 as well, and they've pre-announced it. Uh, so they could be even more bearish and they're doing the QT, which has started now in March. So, you know, the odds are not very high to me at 106.25. At 106.25, I much prefer to do uh, put spreads in, on the DXY, i.e. call spreads on Euro USD. So let's have a look at uh, Euro USD. Where is the 200 day moving average? It's all the way down to here at 103.30. Um, you know, to me, this kind of area is uh, going to be very interesting, 104.61. Uh, and by then I would have thought that the, uh, you know, it, it, it's much of a muchness this kind of thing 103.37 uh, where the um, where these previous lows are that looks very inviting i.e anywhere near that 200 day moving average and everything is really at the 200 day moving average including equities including um, including gold at a 200 uh, it, it's likely to bounce from there far more likely to bounce then go straight through but we will know after the testimony and after nfp but if the market is here before these events i th certainly think the risk reward is very much to the upside gold did very much as i thought last week i.e nothing much i have to admit that i did buy some 
um, simply because I'm very underweighted uh, because I sold it up here. Um, and so I did buy some at 1830, um, not with a huge amount of enthusiasm. I think that all the spreads that I'm looking for in gold are not bearish anymore um, and therefore I'm going back to neutral weight in, um, in gold. I think it could easily bounce back up to these kind of levels, uh, 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, probably not as high as 1958. Uh, but certainly it can bounce back up to the 1900s and while it stays above the 200 day moving average i don't think that we're in much danger of it falling to 1764 and 1764 in any case is a very good risk reward long so something like an abc back down you know takes it higher than 1900 and then down to 1764 that's a possibility but it's very much um, in the lapse of what happens uh, at the fomc and what happens with cpi and what happens with uh, with non-farm payroll with the information that i have now i'm not a seller of gold at these levels i think the next couple of percent is probably more likely to be up than down but longer term i st still think that 1764 is the level uh, where the risk reward lies oil is beginning to um, give you a bit of a warning i'm very interested in this 81 uh, sorry, 82.64 level, if it starts closing above there, it's not going to go a million miles now because you have the 200-day moving average. But if it starts closing above 82.64, it's taking out this whole range and saying that we belong at higher ranges it could easily make a move over the uh, next few months back up towards 100, much like it did in this kind of period. Let's call it 97, whatever, 100. And that would put a lot of pressure on the bonds because the market would start discounting that the, uh, the only factor which was keeping inflation down, i.e. goods inflation, is now being taken away and re-accelerating. Lower energy costs have been the only thing that the Fed could count on to keep inflation lower. Well, if this is no longer the case and we go up 20%, uh, that's going to have a huge um, driver on market expectations and eventually Fed policy. I'm absolutely convinced of that because your services inflation is not going to slow down uh, if, you have, uh, if you have goods inflation again and wage hikes or, or wage demands are much more likely to remain strong and or re-accelerate if that sort of thing happens. You know, the US has been uh, keeping this price down, but if it starts closing above 82.64, uh, I'm beginning to very much doubt that that is going to continue. And if we look at DBC, it just will not go anywhere below the 0.382 retracement of this whole move or higher. The odds are beginning, you know, to be that from these kind of levels, we go back to these kind of levels where we were in mid-22. Uh, and that I don't think can be good for bonds. Uh, and that will completely change the, uh, uh, the picture. So, you know, interesting times nothing at the moment that you can do but if you are expecting oil to be higher i would have thought that the fed is going to be very upset with that 
it, it's going to be a, um, a very bad period for bonds if that happens. It's very obvious that ES has a very, very important area around this 3930, 3910 uh, area. This is the 200 period moving average on my 195 minute chart. And it's quite clear that basically wants to come and fill this gap. To me, this gap on Monday or Tuesday, uh, if it gets filled, is going to be a very good opportunity for a risk reward short. So this is really the, uh, the level that I would think is a sell, simply because you have the Bollinger Band as well. You have the 50 period moving average, which is turning over. And then you can have a reaction lower. Before that, I think it's unlikely. But I don't, you know, it, and I'm going to show you my uh, clean chart. And I think that if we enlarge that, the levels here are quite clear. You can see these highs here. But every time, really, that it's come out of this area, it's nearly always traded uh, 4100 on the SBX. So, you know, it gives you an idea of where you want to be uh, in terms of if you want to play it from the short side. You don't really do not want to be playing from the short side here. You want to be playing from the short side, no, you know, somewhere around here, 4080. Uh, at worst, you wait. Um, I just don't think that for the first few days we're going to do that much apart from try to fill those gaps because people are, you know, uh, love being bullish and buying the dip. But if oil starts going back up, longer term that is, bonds will not like it absolutely not no way bonds remain with a four hand they might even go all the way up to a five handle then and that will completely destroy this market but that is not something to worry about at the moment at the moment you're just looking for retracements back up to 41 to have you know it's a trading range still very much a trading range in inequities in NASDAQ, we're getting a lot of definition now. And you can see how important this 1846 level is. Every time it sort of touches it or opens below it, it closes above it, and then we get the squeeze. To me, it's very unlikely that equities as an asset class, US equities as an asset class, let's be precise, uh, start a new downtrend until 1846 gets uh, taken out on probably a weekly closing basis. At the moment we've got the 200 period moving average uh, going above, uh, I mean turning higher as well and in a few days time that will be providing support there at 1848 or, or 1846, pardon me. So to me, we're getting a lot of definition and we are more likely to fill gaps and break higher than we are to break lower. I think it's really as simple as that in the longer term. What does that tell you? That tells you that growth remains strong and it tells you to really prefer dips in equities to dips in bonds because if growth remains strong, if employment remains strong, it's higher for much longer uh, and bonds are not going to, um, to rally very much at all. So that is what this is um, all saying. And really every time I, I got lucky and... Uh, got long at 1846 and I see no reason why I would want to be short either NASDAQ or SPX until the market breaks and stays below it on a weekly basis.
let's talk about what I'm doing with my money. Now, as you know, I have refused to join this bearish camp in equities, apart from bearish trades, for 1% since the beginning of this year. I know a lot of people are very bearish, but I'd like them to explain to me why XLI is very close to all-time highs. This line represents the highest weekly close. And to me, if XLI goes up another, what is it, 1% and makes a new weekly high close, all-time high close, that tells me that the US economy is strong. Uh, you know, I've never seen a bear market which starts at all-time highs. Uh, it, for, you know, all-time highs for the XLI and we are in a bear market in S&Ps. I mean, that, that's just ridiculous kind of, um, uh, you know, that does not happen. So, you know, explain this one to me. I like XLI and I like ITA. This is the previous weekly high close and we are through it. Now, ITA and XLI do share quite a few components. You're talking about, you know, the defense companies like Raytheon, etc., etc. But it can't all be defense. Even if it's defense, so what? Um, you know, ride the trend. But I've never ever seen a bear market in SPY that uh, coincides with a new, you know, new all-time highs in a significant sector like XLI, which, you know, it might be a subset of ITA, that's fine. But then try to explain this to me. And this is Mexico. Uh, Mexico is now at uh, very, very close, what is that, no, less than 1%, half a percent, away from an all-time high weekly close. Think about what I've shown you. I've shown you XLI industrials in the US. I've shown you ITA defense. I'm showing you Mexico. Um, I, what is the, um, what's the thread? The thread is onshoring, deglobalization, the US using uh, cheaper labor where it's available i.e. Mexico, it's all uh, telling me the same thing. While these things are going up, I just can't see a bear market in equities develop. I would have thought that this market is going to go a lot higher, and I will show you why. Okay, this is EWW over SPY, i.e. the Mexico as a proportion of the S&P. Now, if you look where that came from in 2011, 2012, it came from, let's call it 50, between friends, or okay, 48, 49, whatever. And it's now at 15, and Mexico is at all-time highs. <laughs> uh, it just shows you that Mexico can double from here, okay? And, and if it doubled and the S&P did nothing, we would go to 30 which is a reasonable you know, level. The first reasonable target is between 18 and 22. If we go back, you will see how reasonable 18 is and how reasonable then 22 is over the longer term, say one year, two years. That is not something that tells you that the S&Ps are going to be in a bear market. That's something that tells you that the S&Ps could be in a range while everything else rallies around them. It's also time to talk about the Nikkei. This is a weekly chart. It's impressive. What we have here is a conjunction, and I will even enlarge it, of every single MA you can possibly think of. Every single weekly moving average is now here in a very, very concentrated area between 27,300 
and 27,200. That's very unusual, you will agree. And it's also a market which does not want to go down. These are the three weeks that the S&P went down in, uh, in Nikkei. And look at last week. So to me, in an environment where the Nikkei is threatening to break higher and make new, not all time highs, because those were in the 80s, but uh, highs for the last 20 years around the 30,200 area. And I will bet you that we trade 30,200 over the course of the next few months. And Europe is also trying to make new all-time highs, not all-time highs. Again, I'm talking about um, uh, recent highs. Let's have a look at um, Europe in a moment. But at the moment, this is going higher. This basically tells me, and when I look at the spreads, which there's no point in showing you now because you can understand what they're showing, is that the S&P is probably the least favoured, i.e. the US is least favoured at the moment. But that does not mean a bear market in, in the US. It just means that other things go up more than the US. And overall, the US is in a range and everything else goes up more. To me, the fact that we are so shallow in, um, in a dip in the Nikkei and so supported here. I mean, look at the risk reward of buying Nikkei here. Okay, it closes back below all these moving averages on the week, you get out. What have you lost? Two, three percent? What's the upside? I would have thought 10. And here's Europe. So as you can see, as soon as the uh, pressure comes off the US, Europe rallies more. Okay, it, as soon as the pressure comes off the US, Europe rallies more. That to me is not a, an equity market which can have a bear phase, more than a 2, 3, 4% correction. Uh, and that tells me that we're going to get new all time highs in the Nikkei. Uh, not all time, but you know what I mean and new highs here in the, uh, S, uh, in the, in the stocks, uh, new highs in Nikkei, and probably, you know, somewhere in uh, the 4100s in, in the SPX with a tendency to basically range trade. And that is really what volatility is telling you. Uh, volatility is telling you that we are not going down. I mean, look where vol is compared. Uh, we were here at the beginning of, of, of January when the S&P was probably 100, 150 lower. And it basically keeps on coming back to these levels, showing you that there is no impulsion to the bear market that people think we're in in SPX. Um, I think it's going to be very frustrating for people who keep on shorting equities. With that, I've updated all the levels. I don't think there is anything particular to do before, the, um, before Humphrey Hawkins. It, it would have to be a shock to move bonds very much, but I still prefer to buy them buy the dip into Humphrey Hawkins and then be uh, square and wait for whatever uh, Powell says. NFP, I think, is very unlikely to uh, please the doves. Uh, I think it's, it's much more likely to be strong again than not. And I'll probably be looking for levels to get it short into it. So if the market is at support for NFP and I've got the support levels here, I would much rather go into it looking for a strong number than a weak number. I will naturally be tweeting to you throughout the week. Have a wonderful weekend and thanks for listening.